So hello and welcome. It is so good to see you all this morning. To be here Sunday is literally my favorite day of the week. And it's such a privilege to get to bring the word this morning to share with you. But before I do, we're a family here at Link, and I want to just tell you what's happening with Dill and Dubs. They're in Australia at the moment. If you're on social media, you might have seen that. And they're not there just for some holiday away from their family. Amen. They are they're actually there for a great purpose. And we believe that at Link, we believe that when you travel, you grow when you go. And that God does something in us when we travel. He enlarges us. He helps us to see things in a new way. And so they've gone to grow. But also because we, are, we have friends in Adelaide. You will have met him before. His name is Tony Rainbow. Yes. And he was here with us maybe a year or two ago. And him and Kath, their church, Victory, celebrated their 25th year of church this year. And so we felt as, as a church that it would be good for us, some of our people, to go and celebrate with them, to just give um, thanks to God for what He has done through Victory Church in the city of Adelaide. And so that's been an amazing thing to do, to just really partner with people in friendship and in faith. And then also off the back end of that, Dylan had the incredible opportunity to share at a leader's time for churches in Adelaide. And he shared alongside a man by the name of Paul de Jong, who's a, a leader of an amazing church in New Zealand called Life Church. You can check them out. And I just want to say that, you know, as a family, we share in each other's successes and each other's joy and each other's wins. And so as Dylan shares there or has shared there, we share in his success. We share in what God is doing in his life. I share in what God is doing in his life. And it brings me great joy to release him. It brings us great joy to release him to go and speak into the lives of people across the other end of the planet. Because, you know, we get the goodness and the gold every weekend of his leadership and his life. But it is an honor and a joy to really send him into another place to bring the same. Some of what God is doing here in the small little town of Belito to bless the city of Adelaide. So you need to make some noise and celebrate them and say hi to them on social media. I'm sure they'd appreciate that. And at 10.30, we're going to give them away because 100% he'll be watching. Okay, so we are starting an amazing series, love series, and, in, and you know, we do this every year. Every July, we do this series, and we call it the love series because it prepares us to an amazing moment in the life of our church called Love Week, as Mark spoke about. And so this love series, what we try to do is unpack this idea of love. I know, huge thing to do. But you see, the world is telling us so much about what love is what we should think about it, what we should feel, what we shouldn't feel, how we should love people, how we shouldn't love people. And to be honest, this morning, I want to drown out the noise of what we know and what we have heard from what the world is telling us. And I want to go to the person who has loved himself to hear what he says about this idea of love. And so this morning, we're going to hear um, what Jesus has to say about love. And so to kick off this series, I'm going to be preaching from a story in the Bible from Luke 10 called The Good Samaritan. The title of my message is Good Neighbors. Everybody say Good Neighbors. Who used to watch Neighbors? Neighbors. 90s, everybody needs good neighbors. Yeah, okay, no one under the age of 25 knows what I'm talking about. I actually wasn't allowed to watch Neighbors. <laughs> I used to sneak it. My parents are not here, so it's fun. <laughs> anyway, so you won't forget the title. That's good. But we're reading from the story, and it's called The Good Samaritan. It's a familiar story. I'm pretty sure you have heard it before. It's a moral story. It's, it's a popular story to teach kids to be kind, okay? But can I encourage us this morning, if you've heard the story before, whether it was from kids' ministry or recently, I want to encourage you to move past the familiarity of what you know, what you've heard before, and could we move into the fullness of Jesus' heart for humanity that we find in this story? Because this is what I know to be true. If we miss Jesus and His heart in the story, we miss the main point. And so I want to dive, dive in and find Him find him within the scripture and what he, ha what he has to say to us this morning. And so if you can, you can turn to Luke 10 verses 25 to 37. It will come up on the screen. I'm reading from the ever popular message translation. Just then a religion scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I, 
what do I need to do to get eternal life? And Jesus answers, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? I love that Jesus answers a question with a question. It's like he's, he's reminding us as people, and this is just an aside, that we are an empowered people who have the mind of Christ, brilliant brains given to us by God to read the scriptures and understand what he is saying to us personally. And I want to encourage us to become a people who would not solely rely on what other people have to say about what the Bible says, but become people who would read it and understand it for ourselves. Amen? That has nothing to do with my preach. It's just to help you. And then the man says to Jesus, this is what he says, that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, says Jesus. Do it and you'll live. But looking for a loophole, he asked, and just how would you define neighbor? Jesus answered by telling a story. Again, Jesus is brilliant. He takes complex, hard-to-understand stories, um, ideas, and he tells stories to bring us in on the journey so that we can make the connection. And these stories in the Bible are called parables, and they're designed to help us understand the fullness of the heart of God and what he wants for us as his children. And I love Eugene Peterson, the author of the message, says this, parables, the stories of Jesus in the Bible, are narrative time bombs designed to explode us into greater awareness. So the goal is that you would look at this story with freshness today and allow the truth to sink down deep into the depths of your heart, and then it would explode you into greatest awareness about what Jesus has to say about love. And so here's the story that Jesus tells. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on the way he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off leaving him half dead. Terrible. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite, religious man, showed up. He also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him, and when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. That's pretty close and personal. And then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you when I'm back. What do you think? This is Jesus asking the, the, the man who's asked the question, what do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religion scholar responded. And Jesus said, we'll go and do the same. There are two things that I want to help us with this morning. I want to help us to move towards the greater awareness of who Jesus is in the story and then who we are in the story And then I want to empower and encourage us in ways that we can go and do the same that Jesus asked us to do. Okay, so there's five characters in the story. The man, robbers, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. And chances are, if you've read this story before, you've tried to fit yourself into one of those characters. I know I have. When I'm having a bad day and I haven't loved someone like I should, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm the priest. When I'm having a good day, I'm like, I'm the Samaritan. I'm awesome. I don't need to learn much today. But this is not what Jesus wants us to do. We tend to look for ourselves in Scripture, right? When we're reading, like, where am I? Where am I so I can help my life? But what we really need to do is look for Jesus first. Who's he within the story? What does he say and do? And then we need to find out how we can become more like him. In this story, before you place yourselves into one of those characters, we must see that Jesus is the Good Samaritan. That is the point of the story. Jesus is the Good Samaritan. He is the one who comes to save and bring hope and healing and rescue and restoration to the man lying in the side of the road in a ditch. We're the man in the ditch. Jesus is the one who comes to bring salvation and restoration and hope to us. He is the good neighbor. This is who he is. And this is the main point of the story. And then 
when we catch that, he invites us to come and do the same, to be like him. Church, when we, when we, when we truly catch and understand and have a real deep revelation of the overwhelming and relentless nature of the love of God towards us, we are then empowered to love like him. It's only when we grasp the full extent of his radical grace that we can show radical grace to others in return. Love starts with him. It starts with him. It doesn't start with you and I. Thank God it doesn't start with you and I. He makes the first move. He's the one that reaches out and then we respond. We do not need to read this story. I want, to hear that you, I want you to hear this loud and clear this morning. You do not need to read the story and beat yourself up about who you are not and how you may be more like the priest or Levite in your everyday life. The story is not to highlight how much we don't measure up, but rather to demonstrate to us, to make us aware of Jesus' great love for humanity. And then it's from that point, that understanding of who Jesus is, we can go and do the same. In 1 John 4 verse 19, it says, Our love for others, our love for others, is our grateful response to the love of God first demonstrated to us. Our love, the way that we love, what we do is a response to His great love for us. And so now that we... We understand and know who He is, what, he, what has been given to us in the fullness of His love and mercy and grace. I want to give you three, three, I actually have five quick thoughts about how we can go and do the same. Amen. Are you ready? I love some interaction. It makes me feel good about myself. Okay, number one. I know, I know. We, we're, we're quite needy as preachers. You need to work with us, help us to feel good. But one day I'll walk in the full confidence of everything that Jesus has given me. Amen. Okay, number one. See the condition of the people around you. The Scripture says when he saw the man's condition. We need to be aware to pay attention, to take a closer look at what is going on around us every day. I think we need to ask more questions, to listen more carefully. This story shows us two barriers to responding like Jesus, and we see it through the priest and the Levite. The priest shows us that the barrier of ignorance, and the Levite shows us the barrier of avoidance. Do you know what the opposite of ignorance and avoidance is? It's to see. And seeing looks like awareness. It looks like education. Get educated about what's going on around you. It looks like acknowledgement. Say, oh, yes, I see it. Understanding, knowledge. It looks like enlightenment, observation, sensitivity to our circumstances and what's happening with people and discernment given to us by God. I believe, church, we're being called again as the church in this nation and around the world to see again, to open our eyes and see the condition of the people around us, to stop ignoring the depravity and the brokenness on our doorstep, to choose not to walk away because it's inconvenient and so messy, but rather to walk towards the mess lying in the ditch and to pay attention to the needs of others. And you know, this is why I love our foundation. If you don't know, we have a foundation at Link, and it's led by our beautiful Kath Slevin. And this is why I love the foundation, because to be honest, I don't always see. Sometimes my four kids are all-consuming, and I just don't see anyone else but them. <laughs> and so I'm so grateful that we have the opportunity for, for our foundation to lead us in this regard. Kath's on the ground every day. She's looking for the need. She sees the people. She sees the need. She's looking for solutions to meet it. And so I can partner with that because she's the eyes that I sometimes need. And I want to encourage you, if you are not inclined to see the need that is all around us, if sometimes you're missing it, you need to position yourself or have people positioned around you who can see and make you aware of what's going on. Amen? Because if we're going to do like Jesus, we're going to need to see first. 
Number two, his heart went out to him. The original translation says he had compassion on him. And in the Greek, this word compassion is translated into to have the bowels yearn, to be moved with compassion. True compassion must move us somewhere. Have you ever felt have you ever felt so moved by something so deep within your gut, these intense feelings that you just can't help but do something about what you've seen? Now I want you to picture the Samaritan man, a picture of Jesus, his heart so filled with compassion for a random man on a street, a picture of you and I, his heart so filled with tenderness towards your situation, your needs. And he asks us to have the same compassion for the people we see in our everyday world. This story that Jesus tells is showing us that religion and duty will fail us. He's wanting us to live free from the burden and futility of religious thinking and live with this exploding awareness within us that true love can only flow from radical, from radical grace. It's the ordinary, everyday, yet confident acts of supernatural compassion that shout loudest of the grace of God. His unwavering mercy and kindness. The Levite and the priest are pictures of the law that chose to ignore the mess of what they saw. But grace walks towards the mess with compassion. Honestly, church, if we try hard to be the good neighbor out of religion and duty because, you know, that's what good Christians do, we're going to trip up and we're going to find ourselves feeling overwhelmed by the condition of people that we're surrounded by. But if we live in grace, if we choose to walk in grace, we will be empowered to move towards the mess with compassion and love. Amen? I believe, church, that we need to choose to feel again. In this nation, we have become desensitized towards pain and tragedy and travesty. We see it all the time. It's all over Facebook. It's in the news. It's rather depressing. And so what we go is, oh my goodness, I just don't want to hear about it anymore. And so we turn away from what is happening around us. And we've become desensitized because we see it so often. I believe we need to allow the Holy Spirit to awaken a sensitivity in us again to meet the need of what we see, to move towards people with compassion. Would we allow our compassion to fuel us towards making a difference, to be willing to suffer with people, even if it's inconvenient, even if it's messy, I believe that this is the mandate for who we are as a people in this generation for this moment, to choose to feel again. The third point I have for you is he gave. Everyone say he gave. Yes. The story tells us that he gave what he had to what the man needed. He gave him medical care. Okay, and then he gave him, he gave to him by paying for him to stay at an inn while he recovered. Can I suggest to you this morning that love and generosity go hand in hand? Love and generosity go hand in hand. To be like Jesus, to go and do the same like he suggests, is to take what we have, be it much, be it the excess, or just plain old what we have have, you know, and give towards the needs of others. You know, to see and, and be moved by compassion is one thing. To give towards a need, that's a whole different ballgame. But honestly, can I be vulnerable for a second? There have often been times where I have been felt, where I have felt prompted to give towards the need that I've seen around me. I've felt moved with compassion to meet a need with my finances. I have never regretted meeting that need. What I have regretted is where I've felt moved towards meeting a need, but I've held back out of fear that there won't be enough for me. I want to boldly suggest to us today that if we cannot give towards need and we hold back because money is such a great thing in our lives, we've misunderstood the magnitude of God's love for us. In John 3.16, and this is incredibly profound for me, it says, for God so loved, say loved, for God so loved the world. What's happened? He gave. 
Loved and giving go hand in hand. I love my kids, so I give to them. Sometimes too much. I love this church with everything I have inside of me. I love this church, and so I gladly sow into the vision and mission of where we are going. It is a great joy for me to do so. I love this community. I love it so much, especially those that I see who are in great need. And so when there's a call to partner with the foundation, I do so with joy. Because this is my great response to a God who held nothing back from me. Nothing back. He gave everything that he had so that I could live with grace and love and freedom. He wouldn't even spare his own son. He loved so passionately that he gave. And so we love and we give. Amen? The fourth point is carrying comfort and the band, you can come up. In the story we read, um, the, the, the Samaritan lifts up the man and places him on his donkey, okay? Thank goodness we don't have to do that in this day and age, lift people up onto donkeys. But it is a picture of getting up close and personal with someone, of lifting them up, of physically carrying some of the burden that they are bearing. I believe it's also a picture of spiritually carrying people of lifting someone up spiritually in prayer. When we see and we respond with compassion, we can give physically, give to someone's situation, and we can also carry them with prayer. We're called as a church to lift up the plight of another, to contend for people's situations, to pray fervently for the needs that we see, to pray for this community, to pray for the needs, to pray for this church, to pray for the foundation, to pray for our nation, to pray for our leaders. We're called to physically carry and to spiritually carry through prayer. So let's be a people who actually pray. Amen. I know what it's like where you see a need and you go, oh, I'll pray for you, yes. And then you don't, or I don't. Let's be a people who see the need. And when we see it, our hearts are so moved towards what we see. We're so moved by compassion that we're compelled to pray, amen? And then comfort this man, this man lying in a ditch was comforted by the Samaritan. He, he, fixed his wounds, he cleaned them, he bandaged him, he got up close and personal with the needs of this man, he brought him hope by physically caring for him, he brought him comfort by getting in his face, by saying, this is not too messy for me. You know, recently I encountered, a friend of mine experienced a great loss, and when I encountered the magnitude of her grief, my instantaneous gut response was to hold her and pray with everything I had inside of me. I didn't know what else I could do. When we see the needs of people, when we truly see the condition of what's around us, and our hearts are moved with compassion, our supernatural instantaneous response should be to, to bring comfort and to carry them in Jesus' name. The last point I have for you is do not be afraid of the cost. Here is the crux. Love is often going to cost us more than we're willing to pay. It will cost us a lot. It may even cost us everything. But here's the kicker. It may cost us. But because of Jesus, because of Jesus who bore the full heavy weight of the full cost of sin and shame and poverty and pain, because of him who who paid the ultimate price, we do not have to live under the heavy burden and weight of what it means to love people and be a good neighbor. We can see and we can respond and we can give, and we can be moved with compassion. We can carry people and bring comfort. But this, this does not have to overwhelm and consume us. Jesus paid the full price. He caught the full cost. How good is our God? All He's asking us to do is stand with our hearts wide open to receive the full extent of His love, His mercy, and His grace, everything we don't deserve. And then with freedom and joy, go and do the same.
Amen. I'd love you to stand with me.